Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ivan Donato Yamas and I am a Santa Cruz Public Teen and Adult Librarian. And again, welcome to Think Big About Your Future, Career Spotlight for Teens. So this event is part of the Santa Cruz County Workforce Collaborative, which I will be explaining shortly. And this evening's program, we will be highlighting four local professionals and discussing their careers in more detail. So a little bit, a little bit, a little more information about the Santa Cruz Workforce Collaborative. The Collaborative offers a holistic approach for job seekers to find and receive employment. We provide various resources from complying job openings, workshops, workshops, and to pro and providing one-on-one -on -one appointments in the Life Literary Centers in downtown. And all these resources are bilingual as well. For more information, please visit our Santa Cruz Public Library website. This project was supported in a whole or in part by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Service and Technology Act administered in California by the state librarian. And before we get started with the panel discussion, I wanna let the participants know that we will have a Q&A at the end of the discussion. So please hold any questions until then. And for the Q&A questions, uh, it, it can be typed in the chat and um, your moderator for tonight will, will read them. Sounds good. So I'll hand it over to the moderator and so she will introduce herself and start introducing the panelists. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Yvette Brooks, and I am the executive director for Your Future is Our Business. And it is a honor to be here with these amazing guest speakers that we have for you today. Um, you will hear from a variety of profession professionals in all different types of careers to help you understand and gauge about uh, more about what is available to you out there in the community. As many of you know, um, or will find out if you are a teen watching live or maybe later on watching this as a video recording, um, that there it's more than likely that you are not gonna have one career in your life. For example, I am the new executive director for this organization. I currently have four different types of jobs. And in my entire life, I've already, I, I've counted 30 different careers in my, in my lifetime. And I'm sure there's gonna be many more. And so by bringing these speakers here to you today, you'll be able to learn about those, uh, about different types of careers and their journeys and how they got there and their education and all those really important key factors about how they've pivoted um, throughout their whole lives. And that information will be so valuable to you so that you know that it's okay. It's okay to switch or shift gears or go to college or not go to college. And so we hope that you take away a um, take away information from this evening event that you can um, utilize and also maybe even network yourselves and reach out to our panelists um, at a later time. All right. So today we have Camela Bullitt. Oh, she's gonna she's gonna kill me. I should have asked her earlier to get the last name right. Camela Camela. Blue Bella Blutian, yes. Yes, and Elaine Johnson, Erica Donnelly Greenan, and Teresa Wren, all here to share their stories. And you're going to hear from each of them to uh, each right now to briefly explain who they are. And um, I'll go ahead and begin with Camilla. Hi there. Nice to be here. Uh, my name is Camilla Blutian, and I am currently, uh, I work at the American Red Cross. Uh, I'm in C, I'm a partner corporate partnership um and philanthropy officer i uh prior to that i had worked over um at in broadcasting so i made a shift from broadcasting over to um to nonprofit um i've also been a part of uh i was president of leadership santa cruz county uh i'm a rotarian so i've been a, very involved in rotary um, and uh, I just like to help in our community and make things happen. So that's a little bit about me. Welcome, Camilla. We're, I look forward to hearing more about all those different hats you've worn. I even today, folks, emailed her about one of the, her jobs and asked for some help. So the, the, it will continue to grow, I'm sure. Elaine, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elaine Johnson. I'm really excited to be here this, this afternoon. Um, 
I graduated from law school about eight years ago. Um, I recently was employed at the DA's office. I absolutely love, love, love the law and have since I was a, a young girl growing up in New York City. Um, I love to sing and sang in Carnegie Hall in 2012. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here this afternoon. And I look forward to talking more with you about who I am. Oh, Elaine, I'm I'm thrilled to have you here today. Elaine also sits on the Your Future is Our Business Executive Director or Directors Board. And um, she is a diamond here in our county. And I'm so thrilled to have you. Uh, Erica. Hi, um, I'm Erica Donnelly Greenan. Um, I'm the current executive director at Sierra Shores. Um, fairly new to that role. I in my past uh, jobs, multiple jobs. <laughs> um, I was more in a research role. I had some outreach in my background, some people management, so a little bit of everything. So I think this is a great opportunity to um, connect with the other panelists and the um, and the teens that want to hear about like um, the trajectory of careers, right, and how it changes and, and kind of ebbs and flows. And so thank you for having me. I'm so excited to connect with all of you. We are happy to have you. Teresa? All right, nice to see you all here today again after we did our practice session, right? <laughs> um, anyways, my name is Teresa Elrin. I am uh, currently a work experience coordinator at a high school in Salinas, and um, but I do have my master's in education. I have my bachelor's in English, and then I have my PPS credential, which has allowed me to be a school counselor. So really, I've been in uh, student services since 2002, um, and that's my passion, working with students, uh, particularly high school students. And yes, I completely agree that it's okay to make changes. And everybody does that, and especially talking to high school students from freshman year to senior year. You know, I wanted to be a chef in freshman year, they'll tell me, and by senior year, they want to be a nurse. Who knows? <laughs> and that's okay. That's what I love about it, is that every day is different, and every student I'm going to deal with is different. Absolutely. I 100% agree. And our students watching today, um, I hope you'll be able to, to get some fun tips from Teresa um, on, on some of her, ex well, in regards to her expertise. I wish I had someone to help me in, in high school as fabulous as you are, Teresa. Okay, well, let's get to it. Let's get to the meaty stuff. Um, each of you will have about three to four minutes to answer this question. Um, it's pretty open-ended question. I want to encourage all of our panelists to just think about um, the, how, the process, right? How, what was that whole process? What did that whole process look like when getting into your current job? So the question is this, and Teresa, I'm going to start with you. What were the deciding factors and motivations that made you choose your current profession, um, your schooling, your experience, that sort of stuff? Well, um, in high school, I really did know from the get-go that I was going to be an English teacher. That's all there was to it. I loved English. I loved reading. I loved writing. Um, and so I, and I had some amazing English uh, teachers that I just thought that is what I'm going to do. And so while I was um, working on my bachelor's degree, I actually got hired at a high school in the Central Valley as a career technician. So basically the assistant to the school counselor. I had a couple more classes to do for my bachelor's degree, and then I was going to work on my credential. So I thought, great, I'm going to get into a school system. They'll get to know me. They'll want to hire me, and I'll be ready to go. And as I was working with the school counselor, then I went, oh, my gosh, this is what I should be doing. <laughs> I realized how much I liked working in different ways with students uh, every day helping them apply for financial aid, helping them figure out what, where they wanted to go to school, what kind of school they wanted to go to, all those different kinds of things, um, as well as just being part of a school community, right? Rallies and events and, you know, seeing my students play football on a Friday night, like that is just amazing stuff to be a part of. So at that point, I decided to pivot. I had completed a couple of credential courses and thought, nope, I'm headed towards a master's. And so I started working on my master's in education with the credential for school counseling. Um, and thankfully, the district I was in was very supportive. And so I was able to start you know, as a classified um, member of the team as an assistant. 
And then they promoted me when I got my first intern credentials and I was the intern counselor. Then I was the counselor. Then I moved up to a learning director. So I also came up in, in a very uh, old school way. Doesn't always happen that people kind of start in a, a, a lower step and end up at a higher step in the same district. But I was with a really supportive team and that was great. And it allowed me to go to school while I was working on that education the whole time. So it's great. Wow. Um, it just made me think about how all students are now going to be required to fill out a FAFSA yeah. to continue their education, um, which is incredible. And that's kind of some of the work that I imagine you'll be able to help students with um, in, in your current job. And, and and I appreciate you talking about education that way, right? Like that you, you, going for many students who enter into college, they have their first their first major, and I won't tell you how many times I switched my major, <laughs> um, but you know that's just it's it's just part of the learning process. So I appreciate that that part of your story so much, Camilla. I saw you nodding your head. What did this ignite in you? Tell us a little bit about your story and your journey in the deciding factors that uh, you know what motivated you to choose your current profession. Well, um, I just loved your story, Teresa, because I actually benefited by having a good counselor. And, and let me tell you, I was not that motivated of a student and I wasn't really thinking of going to college. I was a worker. I worked after school. I had a job. I wanted a car. I had paid my car. And so I was like in retail in LA and I was set. I was going to be so happy doing that. And I had a counselor. I had met with my mother and and my, I was the first woman in my family to go to college, right? Um, my dad had gone, men had gone, but women hadn't. And so my mom was like, I really, I really want you to consider going to school. And I had this wonderful counselor. And so she had, she kind of had some, she would like give me little bits and pieces. And I didn't really have the grades. And I didn't really have the financial capacity to go off to a state school because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So she convinced me to go to a, a community college. I went to community college and I had no idea the entire like two years of what I wanted to do. And I was like, oh, but I liked it. And I had to take a summer school class. And it was in that summer school class, it ignited in me what I wanted. I took some communication classes and I was like, wow, I love this. So then I had, but I had also led a path where I was going to transfer to another university. I went to Humboldt State. And so I transferred to their, that school and they had a great communication, journalism, public relations. And um, so I was like, oh, I found it for me. And I went out and I got it. I knocked on doors and went to the TV state, the local TV station, a small station. And I told them I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to become a journalist. And they had no openings. And the gentleman who interviewed me, it's a small market. And he said, gosh, you know, you have such great, um, you know, why don't you consider becoming a salesperson? Right. And I was like, well, I'm a journalist. I was almost offended. Right. And, I was like, and he kept calling back and he says, you know, I think you could have a lot of potential. And once you're here and if you're working in this office and you're going to hear about what's going on when there's an availability, then you can, you know, you can apply for that. So I go to it. I have the biggest list. I have the phone book, right? I have no, nothing established. I go out and I end up actually being really successful and enjoying it. And a year and a half later, an opening came up at a weather person, weather female, like that was like the thing, right? And I had a friend who was doing that. It was in the newsroom and she was making a lot less money than me at the time. Cause it's a smaller, it was a small market, right? And so I was like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to stay here. I think this is working for me. And so then um, I decided I wanted to move. So I, I pitched a job in, in, Los, in Sacramento and L.A., which was like completely unreasonable because they were such a big leap. Right. But I wanted to leave humble. And so I did that. And at the um, I got the job in Sacramento. And from there, I worked in broadcasting for a number of years in advertising and working on commercials. And, you know, I think um, it's just taking, leaping at opportunities, right? There were always like community things. Um, it was a much more male oriented in those days when I was 
younger and working in these fields. And so I would like volunteer. I worked for the chambers. I did things like that. And it, it allowed me to build some skills and some leadership skills. And I think those things really help you so that when I had children, I was on boards at their schools. And that led me to some like, oh, maybe I want to do, you know, explore the nonprofit world. Right. And so that's kind of how I came into nonprofit. But it was because I said yes and I volunteered and I took on new challenges. And so that's how I came to the Red Cross. Well, I, I, I'm sure your story is resonating with the other speakers because I see their heads nodding and there's like, yeah, you're, you're igniting something that I would describe as this institutional knowledge of experiences um, that many of our students watching or here today will, will be living as well. Elaine, I, you know, I love your stories. Tell, tell us, tell everyone else about who, who you are. <laughs> um, so when I, when I, when you was sharing the question, the, 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 the two people that came up for me was, was Officer Brown and, you know, I was born and raised in New York City in a housing project and, and where I came from, we had a police officer that kept an eye on us. And um, so early on, I was introduced to law enforcement in a, in a friendly way, you know, Officer Brown, you know, he would, you know, instill the fear of God in us, but it, but it kept us on a straight and narrow. And my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Kaufman, she always told me, you can do anything you, you can do anything you want to do. There is nothing that you cannot do if you just try. And I, and, and I still sing that to this day, especially with studying for the bar exam. Um, it was those two people that influenced me in, in being the, the person that I am today of love and no law. Um, and as I was listening to the, 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 the other woman that was sharing, I, I was, it was kind of like taking me through my journey of you know, where I came from, thinking about going to college wasn't even part of my thinking. That's just, that's the reals. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on at home that, that took a lot of my attention. So just being able to go to school, you know, element, just, just to get through from elementary to high school was a lot. And so it wasn't until um, actually my first relationship at 16, uh, where my, my, girlfriend at the time was going, all she talked about was college. And I'm like, well, that wasn't, that's not even, that's not going to be my story. Right. It wasn't going to be my story for a number of reasons. One, I, I just couldn't see it, you know, being a family of seven children and this, that, and the other. And two, you know, I was struggling with my own um, addiction at the time. And so, but, but when came come graduation time from high school, which I didn't think that was going to happen either. I not only graduated from high school, but um, my girlfriend at the time convinced me to apply to, to college. So I did it just to kind of shut her up and I got accepted. And I was like, oh my goodness, I got accepted to college. And, um, and so I went and, and it was my counselor in college who I told her, I love the law. I want to be a lawyer when I grow up. And she was the one who helped me to, um, to, to kind of stay on the straight and narrow. And, um, you know, it, it came with a lot of bruises and, um, you know, being the first one going to college and being away from home when part of my role was to take care of the home, even though I was the child, right? Um, and, and being able to get through the classes and stuff like that. And so the law was, was always near and dear to me. So I, I majored in political science and, um, and, and believe it or not, I graduated, which was another shock for me. And I say that because it was during my college years when I was still struggling with some, some addiction stuff. And, um, but it was this counselor who stayed on me for five years, you know, on, on, on telling me again, and I hear my fourth grade teacher saying that I can do this. And so I did, I did walk. And, and right after college, I was taking the outside to go to law school. And as I, you heard, I heard from um, Camilla, you know, I had a little detour, right? You know, I'm like, you know what? I'm a little tired of school right now. I'm gonna chill out for a minute. My friend said, hey, I can get you a job. I said, okay, I'll take a job for three months. And I ended up staying at that job for 20 years. <laughs> and um, you know, and 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 I'm grateful for that because I did, I learned so much. Um, I, you know, I learned supervisory skills, like all different types of skills. And it was in a manufacturing company that had 500 people. Um, it, it wasn't until I moved from New York to Santa Cruz 
is where um, I was working at a friend's company and, and we got laid off and I was at dinner with a friend. She says, okay, so are we gonna keep dancing around going to law school or you gonna go to law school? And I'm like, I'm gonna go to law school now. She said, yeah, I said, I am. And so I applied and I got accepted. <laughs> And, um, and that was 13 years ago. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been very exciting. Um, law school is not for the faint of hearts, um, especially when you've been out of school for a minute, right? Um, but what, one of the things I wanna pass on is never say never, right? Because I didn't think, you know, if I moved to Santa Cruz, I wasn't thinking about no law school. I was just thinking about, okay, this is a whole new chapter in a small little beach town and, um, not sure what I wanted to do, but um, dinner with my good friend sparked that light in me again, which ne was never dimmed out, but it was just sitting there kind of dormant. And I applied and I got accepted and I was able to graduate from law school as well. So, you know, it, it's been a journey for sure. And, and yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's been a journey for sure. Mm -hmm. No kidding. No kidding. Um, Erica, are you from Santa Cruz as well? I'm not. No, I grew oh, up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I was, I, that's what I thought. Tell us a little bit about, about what motivated you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So I, I grew up in the Midwest um, in a blue collar, collar, hardworking family. No one had gone to college. Um, and so I had this whole thing when I was a kid, I was a child of the eighties who thought marine biology was a whole different thing of what it really is. But <laughs> I always had this just this draw to nature and water and animals in a way that um, I just couldn't shake it. And so I, you know, I always had this mission to, to be involved in marine science in some way, but the way I got there kept evolving in different aspects. Um, and so I spent um, my undergrad in Illinois State and wanted to transfer out here. And, um, you know, and to back up a little bit, I, you know, I think I was in fourth or fifth grade when I kept announcing, I'm going to be a marine scientist. And everyone's like, yay, yeah, do it. And then as you get older, people are like, okay, you know, it, I grew up in an area outside of Chicago where not very many people leave. You, you grow up there, you stay, you have a family, you do that whole thing, you know, and I just always knew I had this calling to be somewhere else, um, which was really hard to explain to family. <laughs> and it's not that I was trying to leave them. I just had this mission that um, was kind of just in me. And I really don't know how to else, how else to explain it. It's like this career choice chose me and I didn't really have a choice in it in some ways. <laughs> um, but I say that um, in knowing that you have to be adaptable in even if you have this life mission, right? So you have this thing you want to accomplish, what is it? Um, I think it's important to get attached to what that mission is as opposed to how it looks in a job or um, what position you have or how you get there. Um, and I say that because I took all sorts of detours to get to where I'm at now. And it, it, um, it definitely changed as time went on. Um, so I came out here for graduate work um, back in 2000, when did I move out here? 2004. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, during that whole time, I was always working um, retail. Um, I was working at Starbucks. I was working in restaurants. I was slinging cocktails. I was doing whatever I needed to do just to make ends meet. Um, but as some of the other women were talking about, I had that same experience where every job gave me a skill set that was really important and that actually I had no idea I would be using in later jobs. Um, and so that's something that I, I would love to stress, especially to youth, is that you can definitely get something from every single job or every single experience that you take along the way. Um, you know, there's certain things where I did where I'm thinking, well, where am I going to use this skill? And lo and behold, <laughs> it turns out that knowing how to deal with like different people, you know, and frustrations and all that stuff is comes that customer service background, I think, comes up in my, my daily occurrences pretty often is being a director. And so you know, all that stuff really adds up and adds to your experience of life. Um, yeah, and then I, I spent a number of years um, in graduate school and focused on research, mostly in the wildlife realm, um, plastic ingestion, seabirds and entanglements and marine mammals. And, and while I was doing all that stuff, you know, I, I, I always had this mission that I want to do this, I want to be in science. But what started really evolving for me is um, 
what I'm actually really good at. It's not that I wasn't a good scientist, but what I was really good at is connecting people and getting people um, really enthusiastic about these bigger picture connections to, um, to humans and the ecology and the wildlife and how does it all fit together. And so I fought it for a number of years. I, I, I noticed I kept getting pulled into more of these kind of management positions that I really wasn't looking for. Um, so I was really, I think, fighting a fate that was coming to find me that I <laughs> was really meant to be more of a connector than the person actually on the ground doing the research for the long term. Glad I had that experience for a number of years. But um, yeah, I think it's interesting just to be open to your career path and how it evolves over time and stay connected to that mission that you have. If you have that mission, you know, sometimes um, people find it in different ways or they're like, well, I don't know what my mission is. And that's OK, too. Like, you know, you'll, you'll find something that you connect to and maybe you'll connect to something in your 20s that you don't connect with in your 30s and you'll move along. And um, I just love that freedom to evolve and use your life skills and your life's your life experiences to bring to your next position. Um, yeah, and so here I am in Santa Cruz, and I, I hope to stay here for the long term. And um, yeah, that's that's my story. Yeah, in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. no, I hear I. So for our our students watching right now, if you are not writing a poster board of advice right now from our incredible speakers, I'm just going to recap on some of the 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 things you shared. And our um, moderator, if you want to go into gallery view, I think this is a good time to do so. You know, what I heard from, from everyone right now was reach out to your counselors, right? That's, that's what I heard. Reach out to your counselors. They might not know about you. They are supposed to know about you, but they might be very busy. It's okay to reach out to them. Someone said, believe you can do anything. You just have to try. You just got to try it, right? To submit that college application. It is never too late. So where you are today thinking you just missed that deadline or you miss it and it's too late, it's never too late. Erica just said, every job matters and you will use something from that experience. So don't think it's not enough and be adaptable. So just in your one question, answering our one question so far, that is some of the incredible knowledge that's been shared. So for our next question, um, we will move on to, we'll start with Elaine. Um, Elaine, and, and please don't be modest. You know, I think something special about being career speakers is you're really asked to, to talk about yourself and to, and that can be a little hard. So don't be modest in answering this question because I think it's going to be really great for our, our students to hear this. What are, are some of the most significant highlights of your career, your achievements that, you know, that you've accomplished or projects that you've done? And I will say that you also might want to tell everybody what your current job is today in your title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, my biggest achievement was actually um, stepping into that fear, applying for law school and getting accepted, you know, um, and, and not be 20 and 30 years old doing that, <laughs> you know, and, and graduating, you know, it, because law school was not easy. It was a whole different kind of language. I actually said to myself, if you want to feel crazy, go to law school, because I was like, how do I get through life? Because law school is a totally different world. So that's one of my significant accomplishments. Um, one of my other significant accomplishments I want to talk about is the recent program that I founded called the Neighborhood Courts Program through the District Attorney's Office. Um, we were able to launch, develop, implement, execute all of it in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and if, for those of you that don't know what Neighborhood Courts is, it's a pre-filing diversion program. Um, we, it's on the foundation of restorative justice principles that allows, at, at you know, low level misdemeanor offenses instead of entering the criminal justice system is to reroute people you know that has been cited into the community and you know i sit here and i have some testimonials on my other monitor here from some of the participants that's gone through the program and one of the reasons why the program was so near and dear to me is because growing up where i came from i saw a lot of people family friends go in and out of the system and and what I know is once you're in the system, it's hard to get you out of the system. And, and, and then 
if there are things that you may want to do or be when you grow up, like what we're talking about here, and you have that limitation. And so being able to have, um, I went, but when I was working on a program, about 44 people went through the program successfully. And, and a lot of them were what are young, young youths, some people just straight out of high school. Um, and it just brought me incredible, incredible joy to watch them turn their lives around, to watch them go from fear that they're gonna go to jail to, oh my God, Ms. Johnson, I wanna be a firefighter. Oh, Ms. Johnson, I wanna be a cop. I'm, I wanna be all these, I wanna go to college. I wanna be a teacher. They want to be all these things. And because of this program, they're gonna be able to do that. And, and you know, I, I loved, absolutely love that program. I love it, love it, love it. I am currently, I'm not working on it anymore. I recently resigned from, from the program, but um, I know it continues to do well. Um, but that, that program is really near and dear in, in, to me because, um, you know, some of the impacts that, that some of our people go through, especially, particularly our young, our youth, you know, where, where I came from, there were things that we did, though they may not have been quote unquote illegal, but those are the things that kept us out of trouble. And, and a lot of it I was able to bring was the culture. You know, there are things that people got cited for, but what people had to understand was that's their culture. And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. And so, um, yeah, that, that was very significant for me. Um, I'm working on a high school mock trial and elementary law program um, right before COVID. I ran that program for two years with the County Office of Education. And I just absolutely loved, love, love those students. They get all suited up and everything. They're the judge, the jury, you know, the prosecutor and all that stuff. You know, um, a personal, my, my partner's best friend, her son, you know, did it for a couple of years and, you know, um, and he was like, no, I'm going to be an engineer. Last week, I got told he wants to be an attorney now, which is awesome. <laughs> but, um, you know, being able to introduce our students to the law in, in that capacity and the, the elementary law program, for those that don't know, is we introduced fifth grade classes to the legal justice system, the criminal justice system as well. And so, um, you know, being able to witness that and, and watching our students blossom and get the ahas, the seeds that are planted in their mind, just lifts, just lifts my spirits all the time. And, um, you know, the other thing I would say, Leslie, I would probably say is, you know, the work I do in the community, you know, I have a lot of relationships in the community. That's how I met, you know, Yvette, um, campaign work and being able to support people who are doing the work to, to bring about change in this community. Um, and, I, and as I'm reminded, yes, I, I, do, I, I do a lot of campaign work and people say, okay, Lane, when is somebody gonna be your campaign manager? And I'm like, uh, well, let me get my bar card first and then we'll talk about it. So thank you. It's never too late, right? It's never right. too late. And, and that is something incredible. And Elaine, you, you hit the nail on the head where you, the reason all of you are here today is because of the work that you do with the students and our students watching today should know, um, should know that there's there's advocates out there for you. There are your, like we mentioned, your counselors or a teacher or a professional or an Elaine or an Erica out there to support you. And that's really what it is about today is, is sending that message um, across that there's there's um, a network, especially here in Santa Cruz County. Camilla, do you want to tell us a little bit about Man, you shared so many titles in the last in the, your last answer. Tell us about some of your accomplishments and and achievements. You know, I think one of the things is um, if I look through my career, it's it's kind of um, facing the fear. I think I was fearful my entire. I was fearful when I went to college. I was fear. I just had fear all the time, but. I was willing to just do it, just to try and give it my best, right? And that is something um, uh, that I still have today, you know? Like I, I am a, on the corporate team and for, I work for the American Red Cross. We are the number one, uh, we raise more money than any other region in the country here, right? Because, and we're doing amazing work for the Red Cross, right? But it's, it's, it's so it's still you're always in fear, but you just kind of like you're going to be OK. I'm going to be OK. I'm going to do the best I can. Um, one. So I just think that was 
overcoming your fear and doing it. Like don't, don't stop, but just do it. And, and you know what? It has, I'm still alive. It hasn't killed me yet. Right. And that's how I kind of look at it is like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, I can die. Well, that's fine. Then I don't have to do it. Right. But the thing is, is actually face your fear and do it. But I want to also go back to in Santa Cruz County, we have such great resources. If um, there are volunteer as much as you can, there's such great organizations that you can volunteer. So you meet people, you meet community leaders, you, you find different things. Um, you also have like a boardwalk if you need a job. The boardwalk has a, a, an amazing um, uh, work program for youth and it's award winning in, in the state. I mean, in the country. I mean, they go and speak around the wor- around the country about their their training program. I have two sons. They went through that. It's like take advantage of these things. If you are at school, be, you know, uh, become an interactor, go to interact. There are a lot of camps that these organizations, they can send you to, and they have scholarships just to send you to the camps of Interact, right? Red Cross has Red Cross clubs. Um, There's the mock trial. There's so many opportunities. Take advantage of all of them. This community is so resourced that um, don't be fearful. You're going to meet people and you'll also meet community people and always ask people, or if you're interested in something, ask them. People are generally really good and they want to help you, right? So if you have an interest or you're interested in music or you're interested in this or that, um, do that. Uh, I have a son who's actually a police officer and he, um, we did the community, um, when I was at Leadership Santa Cruz, we, they have the community, um, the citizen police force, right? Like that you can go take, it's a, it's a series. And, um, so I, I was a part of that. And I said, can my son come? Because he was kind of interested in that, right? He was 18. And so he attended. Well, he didn't become a police officer right away, but it set a seed in him that he was like, you know, this is something that I'm interested in, right? So I think really exploring um, all the opportunities that are available to you, um, people want to help you. So if you have questions, you want to try some. There's, there's so many people that can help you and you reach out to your counselors, reach out to anybody because they will help you get there. So face the fear. That, that, that's amazing. You know, your future is our business had Ken Whiting's of Whiting's yes. food from the boardwalk as our, um, as our keynote speaker at our luncheon. And so we have a board member from the boardwalk and from Whiting's foods, um, because they're so, they hire so many students. So students who are watching, go get your summer jobs, go to the boardwalk and go to Whiting School. You might not know this. He is head of the international yep. um, amusement the international park. park. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yep. that's from little Santa Cruz, California yep. of the yeah. international, right? Like that's amazing. So it's, it's such a well-connected area. Utilize all the people. They all want to help you. So Erica, right tell us, yeah, Erica, tell us a little bit about yours, and maybe this is a good time to plug any opportunities you have for students too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always have opportunities. Um, you know, especially um, with our sanctuary stewards volunteer program, um, we are doing our darndest best to move away from unpaid internships. I want to put a stop to that. Um, as I stepped into this role in this field, that's a huge issue, unpaid labor, um, want to put an end to that. But, you know, there are opportunities to volunteer and to gain experience and always reach out. Like I am, you know, as, as I'm listening to other ladies speak, like, yes, please. I wish that was a resource. I would have had the balls or the bravery to reach out to. I never contacted anyone. I always felt like I had to figure it all on my own. And that's such a lie to tell yourself. (laughs) There's people out there, adults that want to help you. Um, so yeah, please, I'm, I'm always available to, to chat and love, um, just inspiring people and kids and youth in particular to, um, go for what they want. Um, and in listening, you know, hearing, overcoming that fear. I, that really resonated for me as well. Um, you know, that to me is such a highlight of life and career. It, it's, it's knowing that you're, you know, if you're in a place of fear or in a, a place of uncomfortable, com, uncom, discomfort, I guess is the right word. Um, hopefully that's a place of growth. You know, that's where you can learn and, um, and grow from that opportunity. Um, and that's something I still step into. I mean, even stepping in this role, I, you know, 
it was such an uncharted territory for me that um, I think it's important to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I don't want to take away from your opportunity to share more about your accomplishments, though. Oh, so yeah. this is your chance to to also face the fear first so for so many of us right we, we don't keep that list of all the things that you do or have done and so tell us some of some of, of that yeah sure you know kind of tied to that is really um the thesis work i did for my graduate work um the take i was i was taking was kind of outside the norm for what the scientific community was looking at at that time um and so i really had a stand in my bravery, right? And say, no, I, this, this to me is valid. You know, th this is how my brain works. This is how I think the connection is really occurring out there in ecology. So, you know, I wanted to really push the envelope a little bit and challenge the kind of the status quo of what was being looked at. Um, it pertained to seabirds and plastic ingestion and their prey items. Um, but, you know, being a junior scientist or just kind of learning, you really have to learn how to stand your ground and stand on your own two feet. Um, and that field is continuously growing and it's, you know, less, um, it's less of an old boys club of what it used to be, but it still has a lot of room for growth. And there is still a lot of just things that need to change. And so, you know, coming into that career and being able to, um, just stand in what I knew I brought to the table, even though I wasn't always feeling brave. I just had to put on that face and be like, I can do this and showing up in that fear. And like you were saying, like you just show up every day and you try it and you do it and you just keep growing and you fail sometimes and you take a step back um, and keep going. And, and yeah, so at the, at the end of the day, I graduated, I published it. Um, it gets referenced a lot. Um, it gets cited. I, you know, to me, that's not the biggest accomplishment, but it's at least, you know, it, it's proof that if you, if you have a goal in sight and you don't let fear take over, you, you will, you will finish that goal and you'll accomplish it. And it doesn't have to be perfect either. I think that's another thing that I like to put out there because, um, it's easy to get stuck in that kind of perfectionist aspect, um, especially when you're walking with a little bit of fear of like, if it's not perfect, people are going to judge or they're going to make fun of me or they're not going to get it and let go of all that. <laughs> Just get out there, bring your, your uniqueness, try it. Um, and so I would say that was my biggest accomplishment is standing in my uniqueness and pushing forward and not wavering in what I knew I was bringing to the table. Congratulations. I. I'm going to look it up now and go check it out. <laughs> Teresa, what do you tell us a little bit about your your accomplishments and things you're proud of? Sure. Well, first, I'd like to have uh, Sarah's going to put up my slide for a second. And if I can have that up and everybody could take a look at that really quick, I think that'll give you some, some good information. Um, but that's me as a high school graduate, uh, Gilroy High, 1994, right there. Um, and I loved high school and luckily had the grades to go to college, was accepted into San Francisco State, and that's where I started my education journey, where again, I thought I was going to, you know, get a bachelor's in English, <laughs> or excuse me, get a teaching credential in English and uh, education, um, in any case. So my biggest accomplishment is getting through that bachelor's degree, though, initially. Um, and you can go ahead and take that slide off for, for now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, but, you know, uh, I was barely one year into uh, San Francisco State and I became pregnant and was a single mom. And so that bachelor's degree did take me 10 years of stopping, of starting, right, of uh, working, not working, taking care of my son, all those different kinds of things. So, but what that's given me is the ability to also understand what families and students are going through, right? I know what it's like to apply for food stamps. And I know what it's like to deal with a social worker. And I know what it's like to uh, worry, how do I buy diapers, but also put gas in the car and then get some groceries and do all that kind of stuff. At the same time, um, I'm lucky I had a, a wonderful uh, family and friends. And you know, there are those friends that become family, right? That get us through sometimes too. I had good roommates. I had a great college counselor that said, nope, you got to come back. That's it. My roommate said, that's okay. Just have the baby and we'll all raise the baby. So we were all there together. <laughs> I joined a sorority during that time. My son was 
two years old and I decided to join the sorority because why not? I'm going to do the whole college thing. Um, and my roommates would watch it when I had the Bionic sorority events, you know, um, when I was pledging my sorority. I'm a very proud member of Lambda Sigma Gamma, multicultural sorority. Um, and those ladies also kept me going many times because they were from similar uh, instances, different homes, different everything, different backgrounds. So getting that bachelor's degree initially, I mean, that's definitely one of my biggest accomplishments because there certainly were days that I thought, I am just exhausted. And there's also nothing harder than hearing your, your little one tell you, you have to leave again because I had a night class. That's hard, you know, especially when it's just you. But going through that and again, you know, applying for financial aid and all those kinds of things, that by the time I did that master's, I paid for my master's myself. Like that's where I was by then, that I could go ahead and say, I can pay my own tuition now. I don't need to take out a loan or anything like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then the next thing with that is that my biggest accomplishment has always just been advocacy for not only my students, but for school counseling in general. You know, you will hear a lot of negative stories, unfortunately, about, you know, school counselors from the 80s and 90s and that it was the guidance counselor or you felt like you were getting moved to a certain track or, you know, thing like that. And that is not us. We are here to support every student, advocate for every avenue possible that students are interested in. So with that advocacy, um, I became very um, dedicated to, I ended up moving out to the Central Valley and finishing my uh, bachelor's and master's at CSU Stanislaus, and then joined the advisory panel there and also became an adjunct professor at CSU Stanislaus in the counseling program. So my passion has been making sure there's more counselors everywhere. There should be more in every school and every level. Um, and that they are counselors that have that same passion to continue advocating for the next group of school counselors. So that's a huge thing for me. And then with that being that, what an uh, amazing feeling when you have former students tell you, and now I'm a school counselor because of you or because of the things you told me, that's why I went and got my school counseling degree. So I have eight former students now that are school counselors and have said that's from me working with them and, and our team that we had at the time really working with them. And I've luckily um, been able to supervise at least 15 interns over my career um, to help them get the experience and move on into other sites where they can get more experience. And so um, I truly believe a lot of people gave to me to help me get going. So I am supposed to do that too. Um, and people sometimes think, oh, well, that's just, you need to donate money or you, no, you just need to be there for people. And so part of why I'm here today, Yvette, is just that I have to ask people to come be guest speakers at my school for events. Well, I'm not being a very good um, asker if I don't also give. So when someone else says, well, we need a guest speaker, I will come join you. So I feel that give and take has to happen because ultimately at the end of the day, Hopefully there's a student that goes, oh, okay, now I at least know who I can go ask for help or, oh, I'm going to look up some more information or whatever it is that helps them get to where they want to go. Well, I would most certainly be open to volunteering and I'm voluntolding all the other <laughs> career speakers here today to vol volunteer their time for, for your students as well. <laughs> You know, it's always a challenge, right? When somebody asks you to talk about your accomplishments, it's hard not to talk about all the crap that it took in between to, to get there. And, you know, some of the things that popped out of, of, from that facing the fear message that Camilla and Erica were talking about was that imposter syndrome. And for students who are watching, this is something you can literally look up, gaslighting, living in an equitable world. Um, it was hard not to take a message away from the three of you about, you know, your world as a woman, as a woman leader or a professional and, and navigating that. Um, and so this next question, I'm, I, I, I want to encourage you to think about a story, you know, uh, um, in, in relation to this question, because it could go two ways, it, it, you know, because you, you all have touched briefly on different, different situations, but thinking about the most difficult and enjoyable 
aspects of your career. And so, you know, it, it, it's not a replica, it's not a duplicate of the previous question because this is specific to the, your current or where you're headed now. Um, but let's, let, let's start with Erica. Uh, and only if your cute cat comes back. I know, sorry, <laughs> uninvited guest. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the difficult so I can end with the good. <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, I think the difficult aspect, uh, you know, in more of like an operational sense is, I mean, this field can be very over glamorized and of what it looks like on the day to day can be kind of glossed over. And people think for if you're in marine science or you're in the marine conservation field, you're out there playing with animals or you're just kind of playing. Right. Um, and it's actually I feel like the information um about what the field really is, the day to day, I, I I don't think was communicated very well to me um, when I would reach out or when I would ask someone. And it's probably because I didn't have the resources, right? I wasn't asking the right people. Um, and so I think getting into this field, I had a different view of what I thought it would be. Um, it never really changed the mission or the passion I have for it, um, but it was certainly a reality check. Uh, something else I wanna bring up that I think is really important to to chat about is the um, the low pay in this field. Um, because of how low the pay is, it can be very exclusive of who can be a part of this field. And we need to acknowledge that. And the fact that there's a lot of unpaid labor often needed to even get into this field, and that is exclusive in its own right. You can't ask just anyone to do unpaid labor. And we know that there's so many people that can't do that and shouldn't be asked to do that. Um, and so it's a, that's very difficult, but I do want to say that the field is slowly changing and evolving. We're pushing to change that. Um, so I think it's really up to those of us in these positions now to make sure we're doing the heavy lifting, to make sure that changes actually happen. And we're not just talking about it, but we're doing it. Um, but I just want to bring that to the forefront that, um, you know, it, it's really amazing, worthwhile work. Um, but the pay can be so low that it could be hard to live somewhere like Santa Cruz or, you know, any other place, um, and make ends meet. And so I think that pushes a lot of really great minds out of this field. Um, and so I hope that changes by the time, you know, some of these teenagers are in the field or pursuing these careers. But, um, I just want to make everyone well aware of that because it's, it can be quite a struggle and I've seen a lot of people have to leave and it's really heartbreaking because that's not how it should be. Um, we need people from all walks of life, all experiences being a part of conservation. Um, the most enjoyable part is that, is, is when you can connect with people from all walks of life and all different communities and what the environment means to them or what, the, what their community environment means to them and really putting all that big picture connection together. That to me is so enjoyable. Um, and it's, it's something that I, it fires me up every time, you know, it's, it's one thing to go out and enjoy some wildlife or enjoy the beach with someone who has that same viewpoint as you do. And you're like, yeah, you kind of recharge each other's batteries, but you get this extra charge. I think when you go out and show someone new, like, Hey, did you know this about, you know, your, you know, this beach here, this species here, you know, tell me what you know, what's your background, what's your experience with, with the um, ecology of this area. And you learn something new from everybody. Everyone has a knowledge of, of um, their environment or where they grew up or their community and the, and the nature aspects of that. So um, to me, that's the best part is really connecting with people from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life. Um, Cause we're all a part of this nature um, and this bigger system, you know, like humans sometimes like to separate themselves from nature, but we're not, we're part of it. And so when people really connect with that, um, that's the best part of my job. I get so fired up about it and it keeps me going. Even when things get really hard, it's like, no, this is such worthwhile, amazing work. Um, and so if you're drawn to this type of work, I, you know, I would always encourage people to pursue it. Um, but with the insight of knowing that, you know, make sure you do your homework and you know, what the salaries look like and make sure you can make your ends meet. Um, and, and in the meantime, the rest of us will be doing the work and the heavy lifting to be changing the, um, the, the field. So that, that isn't an issue for the long run. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's my answer. <laughs> you know, this is available to anyone to participate in and, and you are creating space for all for, for all students. And I, I greatly appreciate that. I don't know if you saw, you had a slide up just a second ago 
And that um, slide reflected your mission. And I don't know if you want to touch on that. It also amplified your um, accomplishments of the, the projects you have going on with Save Our Shores. Did you want to talk a little bit more about that before we move on to the to yeah. our next speaker? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I should mention, um, you know, we are in the state now of revisiting our mission. So, you know, is is it still relevant to what what we're trying to do. Um, so that's evolving. So keep an eye out. I think our mission statement will be um, a little different in the upcoming months. Um, but the overall programs of what we what we um, provide won't be changing. And so we do a lot of educational programs and outreach. We always want to do citizen and volunteer engagement. Um, and with that comes some advocacy work. So advocacy work more in the realms of um, you know, what communities are being most impacted by oil drilling or plastic pollution um, and, and really connecting communities so that those that are the most impacted are getting the assistance, the resources and the, um, the amplification that they need. Um, and so it's important for us to start here, but know that our work doesn't end here. It's all connected, right? It's that land to sea connection and all of our communities are connected. So we really need to be focusing on the communities that need um, the resources and 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 need the ampl amplification. Um, and so here it just shows a few stats of some of the students, the numbers of students um, that we've served over the last five, six years, um, the amount of debris that we've removed from the environment. And this is all with the help of, of community members. Um, so this is not our staff of five, right? Like this is all of us coming together and working together. Um, and the, you know, the beach cleanups is a way to connect people to the issue at hand, but it's just step one. And so we use that as a way to say, hey, this is an issue, but where, where, how can we use this information and really get to the source of the problem and which communities are dealing with the brunt of the source? Um, and how do we bring, um, how do we bring assistance there? Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're working on and keep an eye out for a little bit of a change in our mission. And we're always always, always looking for um, involvement in communities and, um, and outreach and volunteerism. So let us know if you want to, if you want to help out. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I have the honor of sitting on the um, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation. And for our students, just a little history, um, it was only 30 years ago that the Monterey Bay became a sanctuary, meaning that we are able to preserve it better and to keep it safe because there's so many great things that it produces, not just for us um, to enjoy it, but for the surrounding areas. And so the work that you're doing, Erica, is essential. So, so, so important. So thank you for, for what you're doing. Camilla? You're next. You know, I'm not doing this in any order. It's just to keep you all on your toes to pay right. attention yeah, for an I hour and a half. I was still kind of thinking about I know. it. Oh. oh, no. It's just, it entertains me slightly just to see your, your shock every like, time oh, I call um, I know. It's hard. It's hard in the afternoon to, in the evening to keep right. you engaged. I know. Um, so tell us, tell us, you know, what... What are those um, aspects in, in your career that were both difficult and enjoyable? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think when I started out and I had, um, when I was in broadcasting, I was making no money and I had actually worked all through college. I was a waitress. And so I kept my waitress job and I worked Thursday, Friday, Saturdays and Sundays because those were good shifts and I could make money and eat. And then during the week, I worked um, Monday through Friday in the daytime. I worked um, at my broadcast job because it was all commission. But, you know, um, and so I would not, what I would suggest sometimes is there, if you want to try things, I mean, like make sure that you're eating, make sure that you can, you know, sustain yourself, but don't let that deter you from doing the stuff that you want to engage in. Right. So I wanted to try this broadcast gig and I want, you know, it was the advertising gig. And so I did that, even though if I would have just had that job, I wasn't going to make it right. I couldn't even pay my, my college loans, but I made it happen. And I had a good attitude because it was giving me experience. It was allowing me to, to be in this field and to kind of get my feet wet. Um, and so I, I really do what you can to kind of, sometimes you have to do what you got to do to focus and, and make it through, but it, don't let it shot, you know, don't let it deter you from trying all the other stuff. So if you want music, do that on the cider. If you're into whatever it is, keep doing those things. 
And for me, one of the things that I've really, um, when I transitioned to the Red Cross, um, I'm always like, I have to really know what I'm doing. And so I knew the advertising world, but like with Red Cross, it was like such a big thing and disaster work and whoa. And so we had a volunteer who there was someone in Ben Lomond and they had lost their home. And um, so he's like, oh, we've got a DAT, which is a disaster assistance call. He goes, oh, we have a DAT call. Why don't you come with us? And I had taken Red Cross classes. And I was like, oh, I'm not qualified to go up there. I can't possibly help. Right. And so he said, can you hold, you know, can you uh, can you hold water? And I was like, yeah. So I went up. And the one thing that I realized about that is. I might not have had all the skills that I needed. I might not have known how to do the casework. I might not have known all this stuff, but I could be there. And what I learned that day is that it's the best of humanity is you show up. And when you show up, you'll figure out what needs to be done. And there were people around me that could support me to get done what I needed to get done. And part of that is that's kind of, um, it just showed me that, these volunteers, because Red Cross is 90% volunteers. Um, and so it's showing up. And when you show up, you'll figure it out. And whether and in volunteer and all the things, and I'm a Rotarian. So Rotarians, we we do service work, right? Like so, and so we do things with Save Our Shores, we do things in the community, we paint the homeless shelter, right? And all those experiences, even though they're volunteer you're meeting new people and you're, you're helping our community and you walk away um, learning a lot about yourself and the community that you love and, and you will meet people. And so I, I just think those were um, by putting yourself out there and showing up, that has been um, the most enjoyable part of my engagement during my Mella, career. I, I'm, I'm going to press you a little bit to tell our students how you were able to overcome those challenges. So you talked a little bit about, you know, the folks that were around to support you. How did they know you needed help or how did they, what, you know, and, and, and some of that growth that you were, you were doing yourself. Um, I just think about those challenges. And, and if I was a student coming into the job right now, and feeling out of place, you know, what, how did you ever overcome those? I think in disaster work, you're always in that space. You're always not knowing you're always in an unusual circumstance. You are never in a predict, like it's not predictable, right? Someone has just lost their home. They've lost everything. And so what is your goal? Your goal is to make sure that they have housing that night, that they're in a safe place, that they have the bare necessities, like toothbrushes and stuff like that, that they can, you know, we're the bridge to recovery. And, but the thing is, is that it's, it usually you're with other people, trust them to help you. So, that, and I think Elaine, like when you're working in your space, you, um, you, you're never really confident that you're doing the right thing, but if you're showing up and you've got good intention to do the right thing, you're going to be okay and, and you're going to learn and people are going to help you because you're all coming from the same space, right? Like if you're there to help, um, then, then it will work out. And, that, and I mean, that's um, when I do community service work, I don't always know how to paint and how to do all this stuff, but people share, you know, show me how to do that. Right. And so it's just showing up and being willing you sometimes you lead, sometimes you can't get direction, right? You just kind of like go with it, but it's, it's showing up. I think that's the key and, and having an open heart of I'm here to help and I'm here to help and do the best that I can. And people will help you do that. I don't think I've ever, very rarely do people say, ah, you know, I mean, usually people will help you. I, I, that's what I have found. Yeah. No, well said. Teresa. I see your head shaking a lot because I know you're like thinking about how much you've sent this message to students, but on a, on a, your professional level, right? What, what were some of you, you talked a little bit about that earlier about how you were the first of many. That's what I love to say. First of many. Um, tell us about your challenges and, and, and how, how that worked out for you. Yeah. 
Um, well, I'm going to approach the challenges too. I think that, um, you know, students don't always understand what goes into school counseling per se and what it means to be a counselor. Um, and there certainly are different types of school counselors. We're finding that that's much more common in school districts now, right? That there's academic counselors, then there's social emotional counselors, then there's this counselor and that counselor. Um, but when you complete a degree in counseling, you are trained in all aspects. And most uh, many school districts still follow that same model. You are everything. So I might help you do a financial aid application, but now you're falling apart and need somebody to talk to. And so some of those difficult aspects of the job itself, where, you know, just as any teacher or educator can tell you, right, burnout can happen because you are dealing with some heavy stuff sometimes, and that can be a challenge. Um, you know, students in crisis that are having suicidal thoughts, maybe they reveal to you that they are self-harming. Um, LGBTQ plus students who are terrified to come out to their family. Um, they're worried about losing their family if they say, you know, this is who I am. I've certainly worked with students that have been in lots of different situations. Um, and not only that, sometimes having a student who really wants to work on um, becoming the best person that they can be but they have a parent who doesn't believe in therapy, doesn't believe that it's okay to see a counselor or talk about, you know, don't air your dirty laundry, right? A lot of us grew up with that, that you don't talk about the difficult things going on at home or things like that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, with getting that help, right? We talk about there's people to help. So that can be um, the most difficult part of the job when a school counselor is, is starting out and, and trying to find, you know, how do I work with these different students and, and all the different things they're facing? Because we have to be honest, um, there's some really awesome things that are going on in their lives. And then some of them, you're just going, how is this kid showing up every day with that happening at home? So it, you know, there are people that want to help you, right? Camilla's saying it, Elaine's saying it, there are people that want to help you. Um, however, with that, I'll go into the enjoyable, if that's okay now. All right. Um, the enjoyable is the fact that because I have had those relationships with students, I still have them. It's amazing that um, I, I will give you three examples from just this week. I have a student who graduated in 2008 from high school who I got an invitation to her baby shower. You know, that's stuff that kids still ask me to be a part of their life. And I call them kids and they're in their 30s now. <laughs> Some of them have housed out for me when I've been out of town or taking care of my dog or, you know, whatever, because I trust them and I know their family. Um, I had a student from the class of 2004 five who's an educator now in the bay area say hey you're you know you live closer to me now can we get dinner next week i'm gonna go meet him and his sister for dinner she's finishing the counseling program at san jose state so we're all going out to dinner you know as friends and colleagues now um because i worked with their whole family and then lastly i had another student who just graduated from fresno state working working on his teaching credential and just simple things too reaches out with Hey, I'm going to go out to Santa Cruz with some of my friends. Which which are the prettiest beaches? Where should I go if we're going to do this? You know, things like that. And so I'm texting and like, oh, try this, try this, you know, get over here. I'm going, who would have ever thought that they would want to stay in contact, that they would want to still reach out, that they still ask, can I review their resume? Um, can I still be a reference, you know, because they're applying for a new job and things like that. And I always tell them, I'll do whatever you need. If it's helping you get somewhere else, then that's totally fine. Um, so knowing that it was, you know, a challenge for me to, to get through my education, but that there were helpful people, I'm determined to still be that person for other people. And by no means am I a perfect school counselor, right? Um, all these years, I'm certain I've made mistakes along the way with kids. Um, but I sure have tried my best to always believe that all all students have the ability to succeed in something that they're going to find that they love. Well, as my seven-year-old would say, mama, there is no such thing as perfect. And so I carry that message every single day for my, my own little one. Oh, Teresa, you, what you're doing is incredible. Elaine, it's your turn. Whew, it's like I'm sitting there like, 
taking some deep breaths. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, you know, are we speaking to the students? Are we speaking to each other ourselves? I know. Right? It's Ooh, really like, inspiring. Ooh. It is said, truly okay, inspiring. Can we, can we, can we take know. time out here? <laughs> um, you know, the the most difficult aspect of my career um, has been that there's not people that look like me in my career. Um, and that's been extremely, extremely difficult. Um, actually, like last week, I went to a, one of the things I learned early on from mentors who people who mentored me and they're still mentoring me said that they wanted me to go to every, all the different legal events in the community. Let people see you, right? Let them know who you are. And it's still to this day, last Wednesday, I went to a Santa Cruz County Bar Association event and it took everything I had to go because I knew there was nobody going to look like me. And, you know, it was at the paradox. So I'm kind of, you can't, you can't like hide either at the paradox, right? Cause you're out there at the pool and everything, but I just wanted to hide. You know, um, but I'm but I'm grateful. The flip side of that is, I have such strong relationships with people in the legal field that once I walked in, I mean, I couldn't hide if I wanted to. Everybody's like, Elaine, over here, over here. And I was like, ah. okay, there's my peeps in the corner, causing trouble, of course. But um, that that is probably one of my biggest challenges. And the other one is, you know, there's going to law school. There's two parts to this: going to law school and then there's passing the bar exam. And they're both like two different huge entities. And, and I'm still working on passing the bar exam. Um, one of the things I, I wanna share, I share this to share with students is, um, don't think, it, because you go to grad, when you graduate from law school and then you wanna take the California bar anyways, cause that's one is pretty intense. If you don't pass, don't give up. You know, this is not going to be my first or second time taking this exam. And I did take, I did step away from it for a while because I, I just needed to. Um, but um, that that exam has, <laughs> takes up a lot of my energy, right? <laughs> and a lot of my family's energy because it's not just me in this thing. Um, and the other, the last thing I'll talk about, and it's funny because um, Erica brought it up and I was like, God, I didn't really look at it like that, but unpaid internship. One day I had a mentor sit me down and she said, Elaine, free days are over. And I was like, no, but you don't understand. And I didn't realize I had given up, given almost 10 years of free internships and zero dollars. And, um, you know, and I didn't really know how much it impacted me. But on the flip side of that, you know, my five years at the DA's office as an intern has given me a wealth of knowledge, the relationships off the chain, and that will give me opportunity to go back and work on this neighborhood courts program. And, and the other internships I did working with um, the independency court with, with young children being placed into um, healthy homes, you know, you can't get better than that. So even though I didn't get paid, there was a positives that came out of all of it. But I'm, and I'm really glad to hear they're going to start paying internships because this is Santa Cruz. It ain't no joke. You have to eat. Um, and what are the most enjoyable aspects of my career? Well, one of my heart's desires is mediation. Um, and if there's anything I will share with, with students is, you know, when you say you want to be a lawyer, you want to practice law. You, you don't necessarily have to know what type of law you want to practice. Because for me, I always wanted to be like Perry Mason, right? I always wanted to be in the courtroom and do all these things. And then I internshiped at the DA's office. And after about two years, I said, this is not what I want to do, right? And so criminal law, I, I love criminal law, but I don't love criminal law, if that makes any sense. And so, but I, I says, what do I love? And it's mediation. It's taking those two sides and bringing them together all at one table. And, and so I've done that over the last seven years. Um, I've done a lot of divorce mediations and I've done a lot of community mediations. And what I love about that is we, people may start out on opposite ends of the table, but when we're all done, they're, everybody's sitting together. And so um, that always just brings me great joy that, that healing is always happening. Um, the other thing that I love about my career is um, that not only do I get to mentor people, which I do, I mentor a lot of the, a lot of law school friends who decided people decide to go to law school and they, you know, they say, well, I mentor them and I do, um, but is that I still get to be mentored. 
you know, um, I, I don't care if I'm a hundred, I still want to be mentored. <laughs> There's something about being mentored, you know, because you still learn something, you know, um, and then I can pass it on to those who are interested in what I'm doing. And, um, you know, I was a friend reached out the other day. She's in law school. She's like, Elaine, this is going on. Should I leave and all that stuff? And, and I was grateful that she called me because I was in that spot. There were many times when I thought about leaving law school because it was hard because nobody looked like me. Um, you know, I was from New York. Everybody, was, you know, was from California. It was just very different. But people in my life today, some of them are judges and some of them are attorneys who said, Elaine, you deserve to be here. And so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for, you know, the relationships that happen that I get to build and I get to have working in this field. So, yeah, it, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. I just meet mm -hmm. people all the time, oh, just mm -hmm. all the time. It's just, mm -hmm. and, and people really, really want you to succeed. They do. Absolutely, absolutely. Students, if you haven't heard from these panel members today, Space is being made for you in all of these career sectors. Every single one of our speakers today, they are creating a space for you. So be resourceful. That's what someone said earlier. Be resourceful. Um, you giving back and volunteering is so, so important. It helps you with your network. Your time is important, just like we're talking about those paid internships. Your time is important. Your Futures Our Business offers paid internships. Erica is working on that through her organization. Your time is also valuable because you are fresh students, you are knowledgeable, you, you are motivated, and it is so important for you all to understand your own value. Um, and like Kamala said, learning can be hard, you know, but all you have to do is show up. And and take that chance and learn with and get on the what is it get on the program get in the program you know like get with it because um, even though it's hard there's others also learning with you so I appreciate all that insight um, before we go to questions an opportunity for our audience um, to ask any questions and we may run out of time so if we do run out of time audience pop those questions in the chat and we will be sure to get to them we're going to close with our last question um and so that we can end on time at six o'clock here and before my computer dies so um because there is no long cord here <laughs> so the question is there was so much advice already today but the question is what advice would you would you want to close with today would you give to these aspiring teens who are looking into your specific career? And Teresa, let's start with you. I would say the best thing that I can say, and I'm gonna speak just, I think people don't always realize how many positions are in education to begin with, right? Because we just kind of grow up learning like the key ones, right? Like there's, there's a teacher, a counselor, a principal. Okay, um, however, there are so many other positions in education because we really are a full system, right? If you are into business and financing, we need people in our business department. If you um, are into uh, transportation, you know, we need bus drivers, we need mechanics, we employ all of these different kinds of categories. And so what I do also encourage students is if you can get on with the school, even in a part-time position, while you're maybe uh, at junior college or you're still trying to figure out which major or things like that, you're going to see all these different examples right in front of you. And not only that, again, you're making those contacts, right? You're making the pe meeting the people that can give you ideas about, hey, you know what I see in you? You should go this direction. Um, there are so many positions that are available at schools, even for, you know, after school program tutors or things like that, that can help you see education up front, not from how you've been sitting in the classroom, just having you had to be there. <laughs> now, if you want to be there, you want to see what else is available and you can see those different careers right up front at all times and they are paid. So thank goodness, right? There are certainly still unpaid internships in counseling. I know that. Um, but we do all we can to change that up or provide other things just like everyone else is here. But ultimately, just never forgetting that if, if you are interested in something, there's someone willing to have you come and shadow them. There's someone willing to have you come and hang out with them or bounce ideas off of them, whatever. 
please don't be afraid to ask for help. That's what's going to get you where you want to go. Well said. Elaine? Um, the first thing I would share with them is no dream is too big or too small. You know, no dream is too big or too small. Um, and I, I would also encourage them to tell someone what that dream is. So that person can, can walk that journey with them. Even if they decide to change their mind and have a new dream, that they're, that, that person is that consistent, consistency will be in their lives as they continue on this journey. Um, so when they, you know, have questions or, you know, have doubts, that that person's there to just gently remind them of, you know, this is something that I believe in. Yes, you can. I believe in you. And I am never, ever giving up on you. And that's something I say to students all the time. And some of these students are grown. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but it's, it's no dream is too big or too small. And the other thing I will share with them is internships. Internships are the window or the doorways to show you, is this really what I want to do? Maybe this isn't what I want to do, but this over here is what I want to do. Because what I see time and time again is people in my field, they think they want to be a certain attorney or something, then they realize that's not it. But internships gives you that opportunity to see what you may not, what you thought maybe what you wanted to do, but not, but there are people there that are saying, so what do you like to do? And as you were sharing just now, um, but these are other fields in the legal profession that we have because the, the list is endless, but people see just attorney or judge, well, that's it. And it's so much more. So um, believe in yourself and allow others to believe and uplift you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Camilla. And yes, I did switch seats. I couldn't let this computer die on all this juicy, good information. So, <laughs> um, so I think for me is I, I agree with the other panelists. I mean, all of it is you do have to believe yourself and, and don't have fear and, and go out and do things. Um, and really dip your toe in a lot of different things. Just try it. There's no harm. You can always change your course and stuff like that, but try it. And if you have a passion for something, try that. Um, and one other thing, and this is kind of, um, I worked, uh, when I was in broadcasting, I ended up having to work, uh, uh, facilitate the production department. And one of the things I have to say is get your writing skills down. It's just so important because people say, well, I'm a product, I'm a producer, I don't have to do that. But you have to communicate and you have to communicate in email and you have to communicate in text or however you're communicating. But the one skill that whatever it's going to help you blossom and do really well is if you can communicate and it does you no good. You can be an, art, an amazing artist, but if you can't communicate to people or if you're like they're asking you to do something, you might you have to communicate. And so even if that's a weakness of yours, shore it up, because that is, I think, one of the most important things to help you get to your dream is to be able to communicate. And if you can't communicate it, it just makes it holds you back. So if I had one thing, um, that would be the key is go for whatever you want, dip your toe, but make sure that you can communicate it so that you can get there. Yes. I mean, someone mentioned earlier transferable skills, right? And all these little, these internships or these volunteer opportunities all require applications mm -hmm. and you have to communicate and write why you want the job or the internship. And you have to share, you know, a, about yourself and having those, those writing skills. Wow. I, well, great, I just, great advice. In the production, we had amazing production people who could like, they were great video videographers, right? But then they would have to talk to the, the person who was doing advertising and they'd say, well, what does this person want to do? And they were communicating the vision. So then the client was like, what the hell is this person doing? Excuse me, what the heck is this person doing? And you, you have to be able to communicate what you're doing or be able to understand what they're wanting of you to utilize your skills so that you can create your magic. So that's, that's what that is. It's, it's more so that you can work with them in tandem and yeah. 
I love that. I love that. And I love that you're the one that almost swore before I did. And I, I it's almost six o'clock. So <laughs> Erica. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, if you feel truly called to this field, do it. Um, don't, don't let anyone talk you out of what you want to do. Um, I think it's good to collect other people's experiences and, and information on how they got to where they're at. But with that, you're also going to collect other people's projections. So be careful, um, you know, take that, take that knowledge in, but make sure that you are always staying true to what you want to do um, and what your calling is. Um, and I would say also bring your uniqueness and your experiences with you. Um, please don't leave those on the back burner. That that's, we need that. We need people from all walks of life and experiences and backgrounds. Um, and so don't feel the need to conform, please like push the status quo, challenge it. Let's all do that together because, um, you know, to me, that's what this field needs and it, it's happening, but we need to continue doing that so that we can truly change it and that we can make it a truly inclusive field and space where we have all different people from walks of life being included. So um, yeah, I would just say, go for it. Um, and just um, know what you really want and, and um, be like we said earlier, but be adaptable with how that actually um, comes together in reality, right? So be, be adaptable, know that you might think you want something like you were saying with the internships, feel it out. And if it's not the right fit, there's no shame in changing direction or, you know, pivoting. So um, yeah. It, and again, use your resources. We're all here for you. <laughs> yes. And, and to that point, we're going to share a slide with all of our career speakers information for our students to, to see tonight. And thank you so much. Oh my gosh. If, if our students were taking notes today, just with all of this incredible information and knowledge, um, there is a lot to walk away with um, from this evening's event. Thank you to uh, the Santa Cruz Public Library and, um, and partnering with Your Futures Our Business to bring our career speakers to all of you this evening. Again, I appreciate um, all of you. Attendees, if you have any, this is your, you've got two minutes to count down. If you have questions, drop them in the chat. Um, on your screen also is an opportunity for 10th through 12th graders um, to apply for a $1,000 scholarship through Your Future is Our Business for career exploration. That can mean anything. If you are in 10th grade and want to go to NASA camp and couldn't afford it, this is your chance. If you are a student going into a trades program but need money to, to get there, this is your opportunity to do it. This is um, the first of, I hope, many uh, scholarship opportunities for students here in Santa Cruz County. Um, again, for 10th through 12th grade, please take the opportunity to apply. Um, we really, really want to see the next workforce, our next generation of workforce, um, come out with all the skills necessary. So we appreciate would appreciate you being here today and watching. I appreciate our career speakers. Again, thank you, thank you. You'll get an, a survey from us, um, from your futures, our business to complete afterwards. And until next time, thanks again, and I will see you all very soon. Unmute yourself. Say good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. All right. Yeah, good night, you. everyone. Thank you. Good yeah, night. Have you. a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.